All right, so uh, we're gonna get started here. Um, if you, again, if you have not signed in, uh, please go ahead and click on that link in the chat and sign in and we'll get started with our presentation today. For our agenda today, uh, we are going to talk about um, a few different things. We're gonna, we're splitting up the meeting a little bit. And so uh, we'll talk a little bit about the purpose of the Career Pathway User Group, uh, get into some quick announcements, uh, and then we'll dive into our two main topics, which are the student celebrations along data and a discussion on that with um, some um, uh, practitioners in the field on, on what they're doing around uh, student celebrations. And then we have um, Dr. Rodrigo Lopez, who is going to um, lead the conversation around dual credit here in, in the state of Illinois. And so um, two really interesting conversations. Uh, that are being had across the state and wanted to just um, start with those um, two conversations. So uh, before we get started, my name is Bill Rose. I'm with the NIU Illinois CTE Project. We work in collaboration with ISBE. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Rodrigo to introduce himself as he's going to co-lead this presentation. And then there are members of our team that are here as well. And we're going to just ask each of you kindly to just in the chat, go ahead and introduce yourselves and tell us where you're from. But Rodrigo, go ahead. Thank you so much, Bill. Good morning, everyone. Rodrigo Lopez, Director of P20 Initiatives at Northern Illinois University. Um, and as Bill said, um, I'm here to kind of share just some thoughts, uh, share some information regarding dual credit and particularly that uh, scope and sequence. And so um, also part of the NIU Illinois CTE project team, but as you uh, many of you know, I'm also part of the uh, Illinois P2A network and helping to lead that uh, work. And we uh, usually have uh, Jason and Heather with us uh, co-leading these presentations. Um, Heather's been out on uh, some uh, leave and and Jason is out, out of uh, uh, town for a little bit on, on a uh, trip. So uh, for work, work related. So, so uh, that's where uh, Rodrigo and I are going to be leading this presentation. So just real quick, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the purpose of the Career Pathways User Group. Um, one of the things that that comes up, and it actually came up at a presentation I had um, a week a week or so ago, was the group is really about um, people who are interested um, in a particular topic, and and for this one, it's around the college and career pathway endorsement. And so um, one way for you to get engaged in this user group is to use that email, the career pathway user group at googlegroups.com. Uh, feel free to use that email to ask questions, uh, to provide an update maybe, or maybe you just have a question for the field around um, a common practice that is taking place along uh, the lines with your uh, career pathway endorsements. And so um, if you ever, you know, are, are in need of some information and you're like, hey, there's a resource out there for you. So uh, feel free to use that email. Just put it into your Outlook um, email or whatever email you're using. Um, put that in. It will send it to everyone in the group. And my guess is that you're going to get some responses. And so feel free to use that user group. Um, as you see fit, um, we, we feel like sometimes that gets underutilized and want, want the um, group to know that that's a great tool to go ahead and get some of your answers or questions answered. And also as a part of this work, the vision of the College and Career Pathway Endorsement is really about that quality component and um, that quality we know uh, reflects in our, in our teaching but also it gets down to our students. And so um, in doing that, we believe that it uh, really raises that quality and relevance um, and also that on authenticity um, in the different skills that we're looking to build in our schools. And so just wanted to have an awareness around that and share that information with you as we go. We do have a few quick announcements as we're uh, moving forward through February. Um, the first one is the fact that there's a, a nice presentation coming up February 27th, and this one is for um, those culinary programs, um, but also includes agriculture and natural resources uh, pathways. And so um, this is one 
that uh, really focuses in on the essential skills and those uh, and those pathways. And so if you have teachers that are teaching in either one of those um, uh, CTE backgrounds, uh, feel free to share this with them. It's a free training and um, really it, it's an opportunity for them to kind of dive into the essential skills. Um, and if, if a team member, I don't know if they already did, uh, wants to put that uh, link in the chat, um, you can go ahead and sign up. Uh, again, it's free and they go from 11 to noon um, when we offer these um, trainings. So the other one is, I think now, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rodrigo, this is I think the fourth time we've talked about our new summer calendar. And so um, this group is, is a um, really important group to uh, for professional development. We wanted to share that our summer calendar is out, um, something that provides a lot of um, different professional development over the summer. Um, some are in person, some are virtual, uh, but wanted to, to share that with the uh, College and Career Pathway Endorsement user group so that you're aware that those summer dates are out there and you can start planning um, around some of those dates if, if you wanna send teachers, administrators, counselors, whoever, um, to, to attend those uh, different trainings. Again, all of them are free. Um, and so you just have to access them via the calendar and go ahead and sign up. And then this one also is a, a, a big announcement. Our um, big conference for the summer is, is available for registration. And so it, um, if you click on the registration, I, I know Rodrigo has the different uh, links he'll be putting in the chat. Um, there's a registration link, but there's also an ISB conference website that is up. And so um, checking out that conference website, seeing um, the registration, seeing any of the specific details, you can check out there. So we're going to get right into things, um, into our conversation around celebrating endorsements and wanted to talk to you about that conversation that actually took place last year. Um, so what happened last year was um, we, we had a conversation that came up about how are we celebrating the endorsement and celebrating our students who are receiving the endorsements last year. And so essentially what we did as a group is we put out a survey. We had different schools and school districts who responded to that survey. And we were able to collect some information around what is actually happening around the state of Illinois in regards to um, those ideas. And so those uh, schools that identified the different ways to recognize students in that survey, but they also uh, looked at how that recognition really met the overarching goal of um, the, the students meeting those skills, but also making sure that the uh, college and career pathway endorsement is a valuable experience for those students. And so really that's the key part of all this work. We, we think that that uh, valuable experience will eventually lead to some great things for them in the future. And so um, we wanted to share reshare that information with you in regards to um, what was collected in that survey, but also kind of rehash those conversations because it's February, of course, and people are planning uh, things like end of the year activities. And so um, in some cases it may be a little late because I know, especially for graduation, some of those details um, are figured out even before Christmas break. However, um, just wanted you to be cognizant that as these conversations come up at, at your school, that you have the information you need to um, share along with any stakeholders that are uh, having these types of conversations. So again, the, last year, the data was collected. Uh, we really looked at four key areas as a part of the data. The first one was how are we um, initiating events um, in regards to the college and career pathway endorsement. Um, the second one really focused in on the communication side of how are we actually communicating with parents, communicating with stakeholders and in our um, uh, business and industry? Um, how are we communicating with um, different media 
the third main idea is what kind of awards are our different schools putting forth as a part of this um, initiative? How are we rewarding students um, in regards to this? And everyone knows that um, the students do get a seal from the state of Illinois um, as a part of this work. However, um, some schools have done you know a lot more around making sure that those students feel celebrated and getting the um, endorsement. And then finally, the, the last question really gets into the idea around the community partners is how are we engaging our community partners in all of this work? And so we just wanted to kind of go through some of those results with you um, as, we're, we're, as we're talking about these ideas. Number one is that idea of events. Um, you'll, you'll notice as we go through these, the ones that are bold were the ones that received the highest scores or the highest amount of uh, participation from schools. And so you'll notice things like some schools have a signing day or they have a senior award ceremony, an, uh, an honor ceremony or a dinner. And so when it comes uh, to events, it really seems like that senior award ceremony is one that kind of stood out to the different schools on how they can honor um students receiving the endorsement, just something for um, schools to take into consideration if they do offer a senior award ceremony. If, if that's not a part of the work right now, maybe thinking about those conversations happening. And we have a few people who are gonna share a little bit more on that as we go. In regards to student awards, the, the most common ones that came up as a part of uh, that conversation, as a part of the survey were certificates, um, we we saw um, many schools who talked about the graduation program recognition, so they literally have it written down in their program. Um, we also saw that there was an honor ceremony that was a part of that. And then uh, a bunch of schools were actually uh, moving towards a graduation tassel. I know that one always um, brings up some interesting conversations around different traditions that happen at um you know, uh, graduations. And so just kind of keeping that in, in your mindset of as as your school is planning these types of events, what works for uh, your area may not work for others. And so, um, but we did want to give you the information. So when um, those conversations do come up that you have valid information of what's happening around the state. As we talk about the external communications, the, the top three, um, that came up pretty regularly in the survey were that school districts were placing these uh, stories in their um, school district newsletter. They were regularly um, updating their social media in regards to these communications. They were placing uh, uh, stories or, or photos of those students um, receiving the honors on their website. And then there were a few other ones um, that that saw participation and some that didn't receive any, like um, uh, the billboard or television. I, I don't believe there were any that um, uh, were using that as of yet, but um, the, the school district blog did receive a few answers on how they were talking about sharing these stories. So, um, but again, just some information for different school districts on how to use those external communications. And then as we get through um, and how we're, um, using and utilizing our community partners in this work, how we're um, collaborating with them. A majority of districts at this point, we're struggling to get to that, to that main idea of um, most of the recognition that was happening uh, was really only happening through the district and uh, school building. And so um, some things to keep in mind as we continue on in this work is how are we going to engage our community partners in this and giving them some stake um, in, into this work around uh, both communicating it, but offering some opportunities for them to get involved as a part of this work. And so um, again, we're gonna have a few people talking about a few of these ideas and hopefully it will spur some um, uh, more investigation as to how we can get this to the next level because it, se it seemed like this was the one that uh, most schools kind of struggled the most with. And so without further ado, we do have a few um, speakers that 
wanted to share a little bit about um, that work. And, and so I'm going to go ahead and uh, introduce Sue Stridel from Naperville Community Unit District. Sue, um, we, we really appreciate you being here and wanted to give you um, uh, the mic for a little bit on sharing what is happening at Naperville and tell us a little bit more about um, some of the events and conversations that are taking place around um, this important topic. Great, thanks, Bill. Um, can everybody hear me? Okay, perfect. Um, so we have um, six pathways that lead to four different endorsements. So we have a couple of pathways that are in the same um, same endorsement area. Um, but there are two specific events that I wanted to share about. One is um, we they both take place at the end of the year, and then we also have um, social media posts around that, obviously, um, with the events. Um, the two events um, include students from both of our schools. So it's a what we call it like a cross town event. So um, everybody is there from both of our high schools. Um, the first one is for our entrepreneurship students, and that's for the SBS um, endorsement. Um, the students at their end of the year event, it's a culminating event. Um, these students are um, working through our um, our incubator and accelerator programs, and then they have a final pitch night at the end of the year. Um, families are in attendance, their mentors are in attendance, so we have obviously a business partners that are present for that. Um, students at the event stand to be recognized um, and receive a certificate um, there. And um, our other event that happens at the end of the year is our Future Educator Signing Day. Um, that it, that takes place actually during the day. Um, students invite their family and their mentor teacher. So as incorporated within our coursework, um, students do have 60 hours of work-based learning. And so their mentor teacher comes and attends if they're able to. So it's an investment for us because we do substitute, substitute out those teachers so that they can attend um, across our building. Um, and they attend, their family attends, students are introduced in their exact major um, and committed college or university, um, if known, is shared at that event. And then we have a reception afterwards. And so that takes place in the morning and around 11, noon o'clock, noon o'clock, I can't even speak, at noon. Um, and then, um, then everybody returns back to their buildings to resume their day. Um, one of the things that we are hoping for in the future and have already started having some discussions about and are hoping to implement, albeit not this year, is um, a scholarship for our students who are um, endorsement earners. So we are speaking with um, our business partners as well, along with our Naperville Education Foundation who does, does um, financially support and supports in many other ways um, the endeavors that are taking place within our district. Um, the other piece that we're also looking at too is making sure that we're uh, we're equitably recognizing all of our students who are endorsement earners. Some of our endorsements have um, a greater number of students. Um, so it's easier to have some type of um, reception or acknowledge them at a culminating event. Some of our endorsement pathways currently have fewer students. And so trying to figure out how we can um, acknowledge all of those students equitably um, from all of our, from both of our high schools. Um, across the board. So that's just a little bit of what um, we are working on and towards and, and making sure that we uh, laud these students and the efforts that they took um, to, to uh, investigate and explore these pathways for their future. Thank you, Sue, for sharing that. And I, I think that um, call out to that ec um, equity piece is that, you know, even when you have a smaller program with a fewer students, that when um, they when they see it or their family see that kind of celebration or that event, um, I think it really impacts those kids quite a bit. But I, I also think that the community members probably see it as a uh, advantage point um, in the community, even if it's only a handful of kids who are participating in it. So um, really kudos to you for for really having that mindset of equity around um, making sure that every kid who's in a um, career pathway um, can, can access that. So great, great job on that, by the way. Um, you did talk a little bit about the um, scholarship, but was there anything else you wanted to add about um, that component piece or? 
Um, yeah, so we, I don't know how it's going to look at. We've just started some of those conversations. I, like I said, I don't think we're we're going to be able to do anything for this year, but we're hoping next year that we'll have a, enough of those conversations and details in place. We do have um, a workforce um, committee that includes our business partners. So we're hoping to get them involved um, in trying to figure out who, what the application process is, what the monetary amount is, um, and then who is going to be, uh, I guess the judges are on that committee or panel to then decide who uh, who would win the, um, the scholarship. Um, we're also talking about whether or not it's, it's going to be um, within each endorsement area or if it's gonna be among all of the students who, um, who are, um, earning an endorsement. So within the entire pool. So I think those are some of the conversations that we're having. And some of that may depend on, um, you know, the, the quantity of students as we continue to scale and what that might look like, but then also, um, the investment from our, uh, Naperville Education Foundation and our business partners to continually fund the scholarship as well. Um, if, if those are, if that's the source of the scholarship too. So just trying to think through all of those pieces to make sure that um, we are celebrating all the students and celebrating them equity, equitably and giving them um, an equitable opportunity to earn a scholarship as well. So the, the numbers vary from endorsement um, pathways and everything as well. So we wanna make sure that um, if, if we do it by a particular endorsement area, if you have a 50-50 chance of winning or <laughs> versus a one in, 200 chance of winning um, a scholarship that that we keep all of those pieces in mind. And we know that it fluctuates from year to year who's going to um, the quantity of students that may um, be awarded the endorsement. So keeping all of those pieces in mind as well. Sue, thank, thank you so much for sharing on that. And I think that really brings up that idea that even when those conversations start, if you can't accomplish it for this year and you and you realize it's a little late in the year to have that conversation that those conversations can still be had and um, you just, you know, start planning them for the following year. And so um, I know that that's something that's on the minds of different people who, who might say, well, it's a little too late for graduation or it's a little too late to do this this year, but we could still start that work and um, accomplish so much for um, the beginning of next year and, and, and following year. So thank you for sharing that. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, for the field to to really understand. So um, our next speaker is going to be Blythe Masura. Um, Blythe is uh, working at Grant Community High School. And so um, the floor is yours, Blythe. Thanks. Hi, guys. Um, yeah, um, I am the college and career counselor over at Grant. So because of that, I work a lot with the counselors um, and I know the counselors are always thinking, how can we promote things? What can we do to um, do a little something extra for these students? So I know in our conversations, we've talked about how we'll be honoring them at um, the Honors Senior Award Night. Um, and then also we have a decision day that we do every year, and that's a national decision day. Um, that was something that Michelle Obama had kind of made a big deal of for students to kind of say May 1st is the date when you have to let colleges know I'm going to be enrolling. Um, and so let's do something fun to honor that. Well, last year we decided that we were going to not only honor like the college side, the career side, what are you guys going to do um, after high school? And so we were thinking about incorporating incorporating um, everything and making it bigger um, to kind of have everyone participate and celebrate what their plans are post high school. So um, not only am I working with the counselors, but we have a CCRI uh, committee here that I'm also involved in. So those conversations are also uh, had in those meetings as far as what we're going to do. So um, thanks, Bill, for including me. Um, and then I just wanted to really hear what other schools were doing and get ideas so I can bring it back to both teams and we can kind of figure it out together. 
And that's it. Thanks, yeah. th thanks Blythe. Um, around that decision day, tell us a little bit on, on kind of maybe the planning side of what goes into that maybe a little bit, but also, yeah. you know, um, is this something that's brand new or is this something that you did, you've done in past years? So this is something that they've done in past years, uh, which was really, I think, just college focused as far as putting in um, what college you're going to and then just making a big deal about that. Last year, I made little like flyers, I guess, with just a um, graduation cap and then congrats class of 2023. And they wrote down like what their future plans were. So it could be a college, it could be um, whatever they're doing after high school. It could be like some kiddos said, I want to be a dentist or doctor. And they put that on there. Um, and we just kind of celebrated it and had them do it. We had our big backdrop and the kids kind of took a picture holding their signs to honor that. And so that's definitely something that if they have that endorsement or anything else, you know, maybe it's a special picture that we give them and they hold that up and we take that picture and then we promote it on social media. And then we post those, um, like the flyers that they sign and put their names on, post that around the school so other kiddos can see that. Yeah, and I imagine that those just types of little details, um, even as little as they sound, um, in some cases mm -hmm. they have big wins for your kids, right? Is that you're you're putting those things around the school, the kids are seeing them, they're asking questions around them, like to me, that that's something that I think gets kind of that conversation going in the school and with parents um, who are saying, hey, my my uh, son or daughter was talking about this today. What What is this? Right. And reaching out to um, staff around that. So I think that's just something that um, really can be a, a game changer in school. So that's the great story, Blythe, for sharing that and, um, you know, continue to keep us updated as to some of those developments that are happening um, at your school, because I think it's something that even even though some of those seem very little, um, they're actually a big deal for for your kids and for um, parents in, in, that are in your area. Yeah, and something like that is really sim like easy to incorporate and do throughout the day. It's through lunch periods. It's a simple like getting onto Canva and creating something simple that the kids can fill out, and then um, just being outside the cafeteria during the lunch periods and having them do that and grabbing them. Nice work. So, yeah. and then we had just one uh, last person who we were going to have share. Um, Dorletta, I ran into Dorletta Payton down at um, the IACTI conference and um, she was sharing that um, uh, they were doing some interesting stuff with their graduation celebrations. Dorletta, did you want to share a little bit on that? Hi, how are you? Good, good. How are you? I am great. Do you hear an echo? No, we can hear you just fine. Okay, great. Um, I am really a partner of our CT director, Tammy Kahn, who's in an observation right now. And uh, I work very closely with her, especially when we're talking about the pathway endorsements. So what we decided to do at Valley View, and before I talk about that, let me just give a little bit of context for Valley View. We are in a district where we have over 60% free and reduced lunch students, uh, over 60% black and brown students, many blue collar families. And so while we do have uh, between 60 and 70% of our students deciding to go on to college after high school, we do have a significant population that do not. And we have really tried to change our culture from just talking about college to also talking about other options post-secondary. So the Pathways endorsement, uh, I think is an important part of that both for those who choose to go on to college after high school and those that do not. So in speaking about what we do for our students who 
do complete the pathway endorsement, we wanted to make sure that we did something that was recognized along with the kinds of academic acknowledgements that our students get at graduation. So we chose to do the graduation tassels for our students that receive the Pathways endorsement. And then of course, it's also included in the graduation program. Uh, we felt that it was important uh, to acknowledge the accomplishment and for people to understand that this is an academic and a workplace, the work-based learning accomplishment that our students have achieved. And Dorletta, I think that's a, a great um, idea on, on using the um, tassels as a way to celebrate those students that are receiving the endorsement. Um, I will share as, as part of um, uh, part of those conversations in my district, I've had people ask, well, you know, is there a, a color or is there a certain, um, you know, tassel that we should be using and things like that? I, I will just share from my experience that, you know, those um, those celebrations in each district are uh, uh, based around traditions, right? And so um, the, the different traditions around the state and what each school uses as a um, color is really important to them. And so it's important to have those conversations um, with your stakeholders to determine what's best for your area. Um, I know someone had put in um, that, you know, uh, purple is the um, considered um, tassel color that is often used in CTE. We have to uh, recognize that um, they are receiving the College and Career Pathway endorsement. And so it, while that is connected to CTE, um, it, it doesn't always um, uh, translate um, directly to CTE. And I think we just have to be cognizant of that. And I also think it's important that, you know, some schools have purple as their school color. So they might already have a, um, you know, tassel color that's used for that for another honor. And so you just have to determine, you know, what works best for your school district and how those tassels um, um, might be utilized depending on the colors that you're using. So um, just wanted to kind of put that out there. I've been a part of those conversations. They <laughs> sometimes can get really interesting um, when it comes to traditions and why we're doing the things we're doing, but um, uh, just wanted uh, people to be aware of those and and um, keep in mind that knowing those traditions are, are key as a part of graduation ceremonies as well. Absolutely. And there were a lot of things. Thank you for sharing. So um, that that that's a important uh, part of this work. Thank you for allowing me to share. All right. So um, we are finished with our um, stories around the different ways that we are celebrating uh, the College and Career Pathway endorsement. And so we're going to kind of pivot a little bit um, into our second topic. Um, we do have a little bit of time um, uh, set aside for a conversation around identifying early college and uh, credit coursework. And so without further ado, I'm going to just go ahead and pass this over to Dr. Rodrigo Lopez. Thank you, Bill. Um, <clears throat> and thank you for the opportunity to share a little bit about um, not only early college credit, but specifically dual credit. So uh, a little while ago, I was asked to put together a short presentation, 15 minutes to, to as Bill said, get the conversation going um, on a few topics and or challenges that uh, we've all experienced. So for those that may not know a little bit about my background, I've worked both in secondary and post-secondary, mainly post-secondary. Um, and in the com community college sector before I arrived at NIU, uh, as part of Elgin Community College's uh, team, I helped oversee and manage the dual credit and concurrent enrollment programs there. And so I, I share that because I just want to make sure that I can acknowledge that I understand not only directly, but indirectly to the work that you all do and how challenging this is. Uh, and giving all the system barriers, giving all the logistics, and obviously the lack of resources um, that uh, obviously dual credit and partnerships do not have at this current time. So um, with that being said, I know that as we're talking about endorsements and really identifying the six credit 
uh, hours, um, mainly through dual credit, um, that oftentimes we're just looking to be able to go ahead and give our students the best opportunity possible to get started with their post-secondary education. Uh, I recognize that it is obviously a critical part of the endorsement. I understand that there's a lot of opportunities for students to be able to go ahead and ensure that they're getting the uh, level of knowledge and skill development through dual credit. Uh, but oftentimes, the ideal set of classes, for one reason or another, uh, unfortunately, uh, cannot come through into our buildings, that is the high schools. And so um, one piece that I, I am going to be focusing on today, um, and I'm kind of giving you a little bit of a hint what's, what's coming here ahead, is just kind of thinking about how courses move across institutions. So I've gotten a lot of questions about the transferring of classes and ultimately, you know, finding the most value or highest value class. Um, and I think for the most part, you know, that that is uh, um, that is left to a local community to decide, uh, especially giving, again, as Bill referenced again this morning, uh, the purpose, the intent, the value of the endorsements. Um, having worked in higher education and going coming out of student service as an academic advisor, academic advisors, just like school counselors, were very technical, obviously, in building an academic plan. But more so, I think, in the post-secondary side of things, we're looking to make sure that we minimize students' times and financials, meaning how much pay, money they're paying towards that degree to complete it as soon as possible. Um, and so we can be very little and very direct, uh, allowing very little room for exploration and 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 for students to be able to find themselves and make the best decision possible. Um, I don't think that that's necessarily the case here, though, with dual credit in terms of the endorsements. However, I do know that there is a balance that we may be able to go ahead and, and achieve. And so, again, in thinking about dual credit um, and, and thinking about classes that may be available to us in our region, I wanted to kind of just give you a couple of examples and a couple of things to ponder today. Um, again, we hope that this is going to be uh, a part of uh, a larger conversation, maybe a second a second discussion at next month's uh, CPUG or in other spaces. Um, I obviously welcome any questions you may have today. I'll try and get to as many as possible. But as you all know, obviously through the Illinois P2A Network side, uh, we're always you know open and available to engage. Um, so if we can go to the second uh, next slide, please, Bill. Um, and I recognize it's a little bit uh, um, uh, small to read on your screen, so I hope that you can follow along on the slide deck and or when you have it available and not looking through Zoom. Um, I hope that it's uh, it's easier to read. And I really wanted to go ahead and put this information out there. Um, I think the idea behind this is that, you know, as we're thinking about early college credit, as we're thinking about dual credit courses, um, we think about this, many of us have thought about this and used an approach of a backwards design model. And so, for an example, and just to kind of sample uh, one specific occupation, that of a registered nurse, um, many of us know that the route to become a registered nurse can, can go through a baccalaureate program of study or an associate's level uh, education. Um, and then, so as you continue to backtrack, you know, a lot of the questions that I, that I get oftentimes, um, again, you know, what is the, what is not only the, um, the the logistics and our processes or techni technicals that go into making sure that that student ultimately gains admission and progresses and achieves the credential. Um, in, in, in something like a registered, to become a registered nurse and, and in a program like a bachelor's of nursing or an associate's of applied science in nursing, um, given that the profession that is health profession, it is very technical, it is oftentimes competitive. Um, and it's it's it sometimes can be a little foggy in determining, you know, differences between general education classes and those career focused courses that go into the degree, not only as part of the program, the curriculum, once a student is admitted, but also in particularly the classes that they must complete ahead of the application process, right? So nursing is actually one a perfect example where we could take a look and, and identify typically. What are the prerequisites? Well, what are the set classes that a student must complete ahead of applying for admission into any of these programs? So again, as an example, if you take a look at the top, um, you know, um, I guess the, the top uh, part of the flow chart, uh, if students are looking to enter a bachelor's of nursing program of study, you know, would apply to that baccalaureate institution um, and come in as a pre-nursing student. Ultimately, you know, as they're completing their general education classes and completing that core or those prerequisites to gain it to apply and ultimately gain admission, um, 
they are specifically distinguished between science classes. Some programs maybe throw in a math course, um, but definitely all of them require a specific set of general education classes, English composition, psychology, sociology, and other institutions. That does vary from institution to institution. Um, however, you can see though that ultimately, as you get back down to the first part on the lower left-hand side of the screen of the flow chart, that there are opportunities where even if a student is looking to access, um, you know, or go through a baccalaureate program of study first, uh, a recognition of certain science classes or at least an introduction to some science classes could come about in dual credit, but it's not necessary in regards to the endorsement. Um, and the reason why I say that, though, is because obviously if you look down at the bottom of the flow chart and we think about, you know, kind of, again, working backwards from the Associates of Applied Science and Nursing, uh, similar process, right? You still have a set of prerequisites or requirements that you have to complete before you can apply to gain admission. Um, but one of the courses that is very uh, is very popular uh, for obvious reasons is the basic nursing assistant program that typically is a, is a one semester class in college. Um, we all we all, we know that a, this this program is also very much accessible in many high schools across across the state of Illinois, um, and it becomes a great opportunity to be able to do two things. One, allows students to gain exposure, recognition, awareness. Uh, into the profession, but obviously gain a very specific set of skills um, to ultimately become a certified nursing assistant, pro, uh, a certified nursing assistant. Um, in many spaces, meaning many programs of study at the at the two year level across the state of Illinois, the the program and the certification itself. Uh, are part of the admissions process, right? So again, one thing that I do want to just kind of go ahead and say here is that unfortunately. Um, there is inconsistency in terms of ultimately what are the exact prerequisites or what the application process looks for students are looking to gain access to either of these two programs of study. Again, either the baccalaureate program or the associate's degree route. Um, but again, I know that in the case, in the case of the endorsement, uh, the basic nursing assistant program and therefore the course itself uh, provides and brings a lot of value. Uh, again, it's not to say that other courses may not be a possible opportunity to be able to gain students additional leverage or help them accelerate. Um, but oftentimes, again, as I noted before, there's a lot of challenges um, in place already system and other local institutional challenges with agreements that prohibit bringing in other sets of classes, uh, for example, uh, you know, the the review and approval of instructors uh, to be able to move forward and teach that um, um, so other types of classes in that in this uh, area of study. Uh, the second example I wanted to kind of give real quick, it revolves around accountancy, uh, not to become an accountant, but accountancy. Um, and again, one that specifically, you know, kind of centers on on, on the business on, on business. And so, again, following the same type of logic here, um, when we think about endorsements or we think about exposing students to dual credit courses within this field, um, there's actually a lot of opportunities to be able to select many a variance of classes. Uh, again, depending on exactly what your career pathway, what your endorsements can be focusing on. Um, I've seen many that have talked about specifically honing in on accountancy. And so again, kind of dividing this two into two different routes leading to the program of study. You have students that may pursue uh, and start their education at the local community college, or you may be looking for, or students are looking to go ahead and start that education at, at a baccalaureate institution. Either way though, uh, business as a whole, whether you're looking to major in accountancy, administration, management, finance, marketing, um, they all typically more or less function the same way, right? So if you think back to the nursing example uh, in business, specifically at the four-year level, they do go ahead and also require that students, once admitted into this program, complete a set uh, set of courses, often regards, regarded as to the business core. And so, again, if you're looking at it from your standpoint of helping to identify and select and implement courses that can not only um, bring the most value to your student long term, um, but also allow them to be able to experience and really dissect uh, their interests and ultimately identify their long term plan. Um, 
you may be looking to do a couple things. And in this case, there are a few classes that st uh, schools have been able to take from this business core and pull into dual credit as part of their endorsement. Now, I think here is kind of where I want to go ahead and you know kind of start this part of the conversation. I hope to continue next. Um, in higher education courses, and this is more typically done at community colleges, uh, courses are designated to transfer or designated not to transfer. Uh, and oftentimes that terminology um, is, 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 is made available publicly or sometimes it's just kind of kept in records um, in, in developing these types of, of, of transitional programs. And so um, what I wanna say with that is that, if you don't know, but in the state of Illinois, we have a statewide agreement that has been recently legislated as well um, that allows for uh, a certain set of classes across the general education core curriculum. So again, and I'll show you what that means in a second, but allows for a certain set of classes to transfer from institution to institution. All public institutions in the state of Illinois participate in this Illinois Articulation Initiative, but there's also several private institutions that are also part of this initiative. And so um, if you'd like more information, or if this is the first time you're learning about the Illinois Articulation Initiative from the secondary side, I strongly urge you to go ahead and take some time to look into it, maybe ask a couple questions and, and figure out ultimately how to how does this impact the work that you're doing or how does this bring, bring value to the work that you're doing with the endorsements? Um, in this next slide though, I did wanna go ahead and just kind of give you um, just a, a little bit more information about the, the initiative uh, itself. So um, the best way to think about it is in, in terms of two, two sections so or two packages. Um, you have general education courses across uh, the, the general education core curriculum, as you see, they're bulleted out. And so there are classes in each of these categories that all have an identifier, an II identifier, a code, um, that, that guarantees that a course that is taking at a local community college is the equivalent of that specific course at a four-year institution, or for that matter, any public institution in Illinois, along with those other participating institutions, right? So as students are learning about that transition about that program of study when students are thinking about that academic plan. And really, honestly, I really, this is, I think, where parents need to be involved and brought into the conversation as best as possible and also with students age appropriately uh, to allow them to start getting some, some level of recognition there. Because I know that, you know, having done this work at, on, on both sides, um, this is very technical, it's very dense. Why would people know it unless this is literally what you do on a day-to-day -day basis? Um, but we do always get the questions of making sure that you know students understand the transferability of classes. And so the same thing can be said about courses in certain majors. And so um, I just listed some of them here on the screen. This is not a full list. The full list can be accessed through um, the II website. Um, but just to kind of give you an, uh, some, some idea is that obviously technical or specific biology and engineering and psychology classes that do tra tra uh, transfer from institution to institution as the equivalent course, not just as an elective. Um, uh, last thing I want to be able to kind of go ahead and show you real quick here, though, is, is the following. Um, so again, thinking specifically about classes, uh, in all honesty, and I think most of us know this, not all classes are created equal, right? So again, in terms of identifying classes, recognizing classes and the differences they bring uh, in terms of that student's progression, ultimately, uh, their ability to be able to go ahead and truly gain the leverage and acceleration through dual credit is, you know, looking at 1.1 courses versus 1.2 courses. As I said before, 1.1 courses, they're designed to transfer, right? And that either and that comes either through the Illinois Articulation Initiative or through institution to institution agreements. Um, 1.2 courses, though, not intended to transfer, they're not designed to do so. However, some of them, a very limited number of these classes, do transfer through institution to institution agreements. And so Again, this is not an exhaustive list, but just kind of using a couple of the, the career pathways or occupations that I, that I put on the screen before is going to give you a sense of a sense of, of, of what that means. And so if you look at the left side of this, this table, you looked at obviously, you know, the, the English composition one and two, which is part of the communications of the general education core curriculum. Um, those are the II codes. Um, if you think about, you know, a specialty course or a career focused class, or this class that not only 
high school students may be able to get into. Um, but definitely students that are looking to gain access into those nursing programs will have to complete that human anatomy and physiology is also noted as an IAC uh, course. The same thing can be said about managerial accounting and financial accounting. Um, not easy courses, but definitely critical courses that ultimately, you know, some institutions may be able to complete as part of a capstone. The one thing I will say that I have not said is that, you know, some of the challenges and barriers that we know we, we have currently with dual credit is the existing prerequisites or minimum competencies required for students to gain eligibility into those classes. So again, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm not coming, I don't want to be an idealist in terms of how easy or simple this can be, but I just wanted to kind of think about more about how courses do change and vary across not only programs, um, and, and opportunities to make sure that as we're communicating this to families, um, that we that we do the best we can with preparing them with that information. Um, the last thing I'll say is obviously here with the 1.2 courses, um, basic nursing assistant program is not a course that is intended to transfer. Um, however, as, as I just said, uh, the course itself leads to the certification that's very, very important uh, for that student to be able to go ahead and continue to foster that not only relationship and, and recognition and hopefully gain that motivation to pursue a higher credential in that field. Um, and in terms of business, there's several business courses that although they don't carry with them an IAI code, they do transfer. Um, but I will say this again, it does vary. Unfortunately, it does vary from institution to institution across the state of Illinois. And so that's why it's very critical that as you're doing this work with your post-secondary partners, that you bring into the full this information about being able to, as best as possible, organize classes um, you know, across 1.1 and 1.2. Um, so the last thing I wanna leave you with before we close out is just kind of a set of questions. Um, one, uh, yeah, and Bill, if we can go to the next slide, please. So this is just some questions that I've, I think I've always had, not only for myself in the practice, but with others that I do this work with across post-secondary and, sec and secondary. And most recently, uh, if you've been a part of our work with the Dual Credit Think Tank and the Illinois Between Network, we've been asking this not only locally and regionally, but across the state. I think it does help us to set some sort of vision or direction in terms of ultimately, how do we think, or what do we think we think about dual credit courses and how do they fit into our larger early college credit program curriculum and how do we communicate that out? How do we identify, how do we place value in this for students um, and families specifically, how are they advised? Um, I think more than anything, and we do this very much intentionally, <laughs> every second we get in, in higher education is, especially in the community college space, it is very critical that students understand whether or not that course that they're taking will gain them either equivalent, elective, or no credit at all as they move from one institution to the next. Um, that by far, obviously, I think is, is something that we owe not only students and families, but we owe it to ourselves to be as clear and transparent to, to families about that. Um, given that this is very technical, this is very complex, I, again, like I said, ultimately, I think it's also thinking about how dual credit in and of itself um, can help that student further develop their interest and understanding strengths and opportunities uh, as they decide potentially on pursuing their education right after high school through a program of study at a, at a community college or at a, at a baccalaureate institution. So uh, I think, again, finding the value beyond the credit definitely has to be integrated into the what we do. Um, with that being said, thank you, Bill, for the time. I, I know that was very short and fast, but I do look forward to continuing this conversation. And, and more than anything, I thank uh, those that are here with us uh, for the conversations we have had. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions, if you'd like to engage with this, you know, this topic further, please do not hesitate to reach out. So Rodrigo, um, thank you for sharing all of this uh, valuable information. I did want to address a few questions in the chat uh, before we go. One was um, by uh, Patrick Enright, which he said, a lot of colleges and universities do not have direct admission to a college program such as nursing or accounting. Are universities moving towards accepting CCPE as credit or at least using it toward direct admission into a college program? 
Yeah, that's a really good question. So again, I think in terms of dual credit, right, if you're thinking about the dual credit, which is a college course, and if it's, you know, comes with that transferability through either the II or some sort of agreement, that, that credit should follow the student, right? So that should be admitted credit. But I think the question is much larger than that. I think to your point is, you know, the currency. And I know a lot of people have been working on the currency in terms of what the recognition and value is uh, for universities to be able to go ahead and provide students with greater opportunities. Um, I know that that is being discussed. And so I think I would say without saying too much, uh, more to come on that. Uh, there's a lot of work being done in that, I think. And for my personal opinion, this is Rodrigo. And as I shared with a, a colleague just recently, um, Someone, I think, said in the chat uh, the importance and how critical it is to get employers to recognize the work of the endorsements, but really be able to hone in on the value of it. Uh, I think post-secondary obviously not only has to do that, but needs to be able to go ahead and come with that as well. And so uh, a lot of work to be done there. I think there is very good intentions on the post-secondary side, and there's a lot of great opportunities that I think are still untapped. Thanks for thanks for answering that. Um, due to time, what we're going to do is we're going to um, get towards the end of our presentation. And then if people have individual questions they want to share or um, ask Rodrigo um, after after the presentation, um, I think that would be a good use of some time. So um, I'm just looking at the chat just to see if there were any other ones that we would hit on. But um, all right. Thank you, Rodrigo, for sharing that uh, important information on dual credit. We made it through the agenda uh, for today. Um, and, and all we're going to ask you uh, for the rest of your time is to take some time to fill out that evaluation. Um, if someone from our team can put that in the chat um, as we move forward, please take that evaluation because it helps us um, offer, you know, it gives us feedback on, on how we're offering this time for you. Um, a few additional um, items uh, to, to just bring up before we go. There are some additional resources uh, on the ISB webpage around the ISB uh, College and Career Pathway Endorsement. So if there are um, things that you're looking at, please refer to that webpage. They have um, a whole slew of resources around academic readiness, the coordinators. Um, we also know that Heather offers those office hours uh, where she is regularly meeting with um, individuals from the state on her own time, answering questions, going through um, the application process with people. And so we just always share that, um, utilize that time if, if you have questions um, that you need answered from the state. Uh, Heather does a fantastic job of offering her, her time to um, individuals in the field. Um, next, next meeting, we're going to touch a little bit more on the course sequence orientation application and capstone courses on the 15th. Um, that sounds like it's far away. It's actually about three weeks away. So, um, and for some of you, you'll be getting ready for spring break. So we wanted to uh, put that out there as our next topic for discussion. Uh, when we get to the 19th in April, uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit more about the individual student plan. So if anyone um, is interested in, in has questions around those, or maybe has an experience around either one of those um, that they want would like to share too. Feel free to reach out to us. Um, we're always open, opening to having that conversation with individuals and how your story can um, actually um, can sh share that experience with the rest of the field. So, again, take that evaluation before you go. Um, it provides us valuable feedback. Like I said, our next meeting is Friday, March 15th um, at 9 a.m. And again, if if you do have general questions for the field, use that email. Uh, put, put that Career Pathways user group at Google Groups in your email. Send out a question. Um, it will go to everyone as a part of our user group. And you might be surprised uh, at how you um, get a, a lot of responses from people in the field. We, we want this to be an experience that is beneficial to everyone. and um, sometimes that that um, that part of this work gets underutilized and we just want you to be aware that you can use that as a tool um, to get some questions answered from the field.